YouTube. Thank you, Sarah, for that. And um, a lot of the sermons are on there, so you're welcome to go back. If you missed something, you skipped a church. You know, you get these knit one, slip one Christians. You know what that is? Those who do needlework know what a knit one, slip one is. Okay, knit one, go to church, slip one here. Yeah. <laughs> So if you missed the sermon, you're welcome to go on YouTube and uh, catch up there, because I think it's important that you follow. Romans 6 verse 1, let me read again. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been unif united with him in a, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Truly, we have freedom in Christ. Amen? Let's just go bow before the Lord this morning. Lord, we commit this time to you. We commit this half an hour to an hour that we spend around your word and ask, Lord, that you will just come and minister to us through your spirit, that you will give us understanding Help us, Lord, to understand the word. Help us, Lord, to, to see where, how this affects the this, this scripture, our lives, and how we can live according to your plan, your purpose, your intentions for us. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this word to each heart. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Romans 6, verse 1 to 6, well, we can go down to 1 to 14, actually. That's one title under uh, Freedom in Christ. And um, it's pretty straightforward understanding. It's not really difficult, but theologians make it difficult. Amen? No, don't say amen. Because there are some differences when people read the scriptures. But I think it's very straightforward. So we have learned from chapter 5, Romans 5, that, and we spoke about this, that Jesus died for our sins, he rose for our justification, and we appropriate this new relationship with God. We accept it by God. That's what righteousness means. That's what it means to be justified, to be made right with him when God accepts us. And this all happens by faith. So that's the very key to Romans 5 to understand to receive reconciliation by faith. It is by faith that we obtain. That's how chapter 5 starts. We obtain access into the grace of God through faith. And when we enter into God's grace, we are also assured of a salvation from the future wrath. But what about this life? Yes, I'm a child of God. Yes, I'm justified, made right with God. But what about the here and now? And I think that's where Paul kind of transitions to from chapter 5 to chapter 6. From justification, he's transitioning to sanctification. He's going to talk about that. And we'll find that in chapter 6, chapter 7, where he also talks about his struggle with sin and this life because in actual fact, theologically, we are free from sin. We are free in Christ. Amen? But we all struggle with sin. And that's what he starts dealing with. He builds on everything he said before. Justification by faith showed us that Christ's death and resurrection not only frees us from the penalty of sin and the wrath, the future wrath, it also saves us from the power of sin, here and now. That is sanctification. And I've probably said this more than once in many sermons, that our salvation has actually three components. Justification, being made right with God, your position 
who you are, your status before God. You're an enemy, you become a child of God. And then the sanctification is an ongoing thing. I am daily sanctified. God changes me. It's a process. And then the last component, the glorification component. When Jesus comes, thank God, we will be rid of this sin, body and flesh, and we will be rid of sin in our lives. Amen? Looking forward to that. So Paul builds on all of that. So we are moving into what is called sanctification. We are not only justified by faith made right with Him, but we are also being sanctified every day, here and now. And that's Romans 6. Paul moving from what it means to be justified to what it means to be sanctified. And it's important that you don't confuse the two. Don't confuse justification with sanctification because if you make sanctification the, the condition for salvation, then it becomes a work salvation. And if you sin, you lost. If you repent, you're, um, you're saved again. And then people get confused. And we spoke about that in Romans 5, that none, none is sinless. No one can be perfect 100% all the time. Justification, and I've said it, means to be right with God. That happens once in your life. Only once. When you put your faith in Jesus... When you believe on Him and accept Him as Lord and Savior, at that moment, you are saved from the wrath of God. At that moment, you are a child of God. You are justified. And then sanctification kicks in. It begins at that moment. But it's continuous. It keeps on. It's a process. From the day you become a child of God, God is sanctifying you. He's molding you. He's forming you. He's changing you. We're not angels on day one. Okay? And by the way, we're not becoming angels. Some people believe when I'm in heaven, I'm an angel. <laughs> no. You're still a human, but a saved one, and a redeemed one, and a glorified one. Angels are different beings. <laughs> Romans 6 is about sanctification. So Paul pictures, the way he pictures sin uh, in this chapter is that sin is, is a power, it's a master that controlled you. Before you were saved and when you were justified, this power of sin, this master of sin, is now the tyranny of sin is broken. Those who are in Christ are redeemed, are saved, are free from the bondage of sin. Amen. And you must believe that because it's important when it comes to sanctification. That is why you will see Paul uses imagery of slavery, of mastery, of freedom. Those who are in Christ no longer slaves of sin. Sin is no longer your master. Sin does not rule over you no more. They ha you have been set free. Not only from death, but the power of sin as well. The believer's union, and the way Paul describes this and explains this, is the believer's union with Christ. Not only frees him from death, but also frees him from the tyranny of sin. The believer's justification unleashes the power of God for salvation in your daily spiritual walk with the Lord. It unleashes that. And when the believer is transformed from the old life, the old man, to the new one, he also brings with him, if you've noticed that, uh, uh, some old impulses, some old habits, some old tendencies comes with you. Only until the believer is glorified, the third component, will he still be and in contact with the old man. But the believer is free, does not have to bow to the sin, the old master, 
He's free in Christ. That's what Romans 6 is about. So we can go home. That's what Romans 6 is about. It's about freedom in Christ. Now I want to talk about the first one. The reality of grace. Let's see what grace is. Because some people view grace in a wrong way. Romans 6 verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Are we con to continue in sin that grace may abound? Obviously, he's continuing from the previous thought. So you need to understand what, why he's asking this question. What shall we say? Shall we continue to sin that grace? Because his whole argument since Romans 1, you are all sinners, you all need salvation, and salvation does not come from chapter 3, 4, through the law, through rituals, through anything you do, it's by the grace of God. And then chapter 5.20, where sin increased, grace abounded the more. Remember that verse? And there might be some who hear that and then interpret that and say, Oh, so I can sin more because grace will abound more. They'll use that as an excuse. They'll use grace as a license to sin. Now, personally, this is just Rudy Puerta 3 verse 3. Personally, I think when someone thinks that way about the grace of God, he has not experienced the saving grace of God. Let's just take it for what it is. He's using grace as a license, as an excuse to continue to live in sin. And Paul's not saying that God will give you more grace while you remain willfully in a state of sin. It's not what he's saying. How can the knowledge of that, that knowledge that God has forgiven your sins in the past lead you to more sin? How can the knowledge that Christ died for you on the cross because of your sin now lead you and to do more sin and ask for more forgiveness yes we must repent yes we must ask the lord when we sin forgiveness but it is wrong to think that grace allows you now to sin and gives you an excuse i think only foolish people think that way but the reason paul addresses this question is to Draw out the implications of the Christian's experience of grace. Now, grace does not undercut morality. Grace does not encourage sinning. The grace of God that the Christian access through faith does not lead to licentiousness, but it leads to righteousness. It leads to sanctification. It leads to godly living. That's the grace of God. Grace is not freedom to sin. Grace is freedom from sin. That is the true biblical understanding. The reality of grace. Verse 2 says, by no means, so he actually answers his own question, shall we continue to, to live in sin? He says, by no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? That's the argument. Freedom in Christ means that you are dead to sin. You're not its slave anymore. You are free from sin. And the biblical, now we need to understand the biblical definition of sin. Do you remember we spoke about this? What's the biblical definition of sin? Missing the marks, yeah, but the definition is separation from death. Sorry, the definition of death. Sorry, um, sin, you're right. Missing the mark. But death, the definition of in the Bible means separation. Did you know that? When your uh, blood separates from your body, you're going to die. Okay, that's what death means. Separation. The believer is dead to sin. The believer is separated from sin. Yes, the believer is separated from the penalty of sin when he is saved. But the context of Romans 6 
is clear that the believer is not only separated from the penalty, but he's separated from the power of sin over his life. Verse 6 says, we are no longer slaves to sin. So when did this death to sin take place? It took place the moment you believed. It took place when you were saved. When a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, he's justified. And in that moment, he dies with Christ. And that's what we're going to go into the next point when we get there. He dies, he's, he's identified with Christ in his death and resurrection. Death is that then connected in this context to baptism. And that's what is the next verse we will look at in verse 3. So we'll spoke, speak about that. So Paul asked the question, how can you still live in sin when you died to sin? When you were separated from sin? He's not saying that the believer has no ability to sin. Because some people say, okay, if, you, if he says, how can you live in sin? If you died to sin, it means you're dead to sin, meaning you don't have the ability to sin. Some people view death in that definition. That's wrong. That would mean that spiritual dead people cannot walk, breathe, talk, do anything. Unfortunately, I know many spiritual dead people who do bad things. And they can do things. Okay? But death means to be separated. So, the believer does have the ability, but it's not like a, man, a dead man that cannot breathe. Why would God then command Believers not to lust if they cannot do any sin. Why would God command believers not to steal if they are dead to greed? The Bible is full of examples of godly men who sinned. Noah, he got drunk. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob lied. David committed adultery and murder. Romans 7, we'll see Paul struggles with sin in his life. Death in the biblical definition is not cessation, it is separation. And I want to make that point clear. When we die to sin, we are separated from its bondage, from its power. We are set, die to sin and to live in sin, as he says, how can you still live in sin? It simply describes a lifestyle of sinning, someone who habitually practices sin, a life that is characterized by sin. That's not the new believer's life anymore. How can you who died to sin still continue to live in sin, to practice sin? Because a, a new life, a believer's life, is characterized by righteousness. He's, in other words, the believer cannot remain in sin. He cannot live in sin. He cannot continue on the path of sin. Sin's power is broken. He's separated from sin. It has no rule over him. And he is free in Christ. It has no say on your life. And when you are saved, it will be evident in your life that sin doesn't rule you anymore. But believers still sin. And we'll get to all of it, what Paul is trying to say. Yes, believers do sin. But when they sin, it is inconsistent with the reality of grace. It is inconsistent to what God has made him in Christ. Living in sin is incompatible with Christian existence. It remains a threat, a real threat. So how can you still live in it? We don't have to live in sin because Christ has set us free from the power of sin. Both justification and sanctification provided in Christ. Both of them, genuine faith in Christ, will lead to a transformed life and a desire to live for Him. That's the reality of grace. The reality of grace is that the believer is no longer a slave. He's been given new life. 
Grace is not a license to sin. It's, not, it's a transformative power that enables you to live a life that is pleasing to God. Titus, and I quoted that before, the saving grace that appeared to all men teaches us to live and un- un- um, to live us live godly lives and lives that are pleasing to Him. Those who are born of God cannot continue to live a lifestyle of sin. Don't tell me, oh, I'm saved, the grace of God keeps me saved, but you still continue in sin. Then I question mark. Because there must be a reality of true grace in your life. Now Paul continues to explain how is this possible. How is it possible that grace changes us and we are new men and we are dead to sin? And he explains it in verse 3 and I call it because of our identification with Christ. It's because of our identification with Jesus Christ. Verse 3 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? And when you hear the word baptism, oh goodness, then it's confusion. Okay? Because there's so many views. What baptism is this? Some believe there's mainly two groups. Many others maybe. But the main two groups says, the one says, oh, Paul is talking about water baptism. That's that pool there that we have there when we put people in the water. For those who are new to the church, to the Baptist church, that's Water baptism. We call it believer's baptism. Some say no, it doesn't refer, it doesn't even mention water. It's not talking about water. So, so they say Paul is actually referring to spirit baptism. Now, Ephesians 4 says there's only one baptism. We spoke about that when we did Ephesians 4. So how should we understand this verse? Now, the easiest way, and I'm always trying to make it easy, okay, to understand, the easiest way to put this is, Paul is here referring to a spiritual reality of what is taking place at salvation. When you're saved, you're baptized into Christ. It's a spiritual event. It's something that happens. When you get saved, you're baptized into Christ. And I think we all can agree on that. It doesn't matter what your view is on what baptism you think it is. I think we all agree when you're saved, you're placed into Jesus Christ. You are, but baptism means to submerge, to immerse, to be placed into Jesus Christ. Whichever way you describe this, I believe that being baptized into Christ is the spirit baptism. Where the Spirit places you into Christ, into His body. Also explained in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, where He says, For in one Spirit, the in, the Greek word is en, can also be translated as with one Spirit, with one Spirit, we are baptized all into one body, Jews, Greeks, slaves or free men, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. That's what happens when you get saved. The Holy Spirit takes you, puts you in Christ. It's a wonderful work of God. It's not not something we do, it's God that does that. Those who are saved, baptized into Christ Jesus. Now did Paul say there is, uh, did, did Paul not say there is only one baptism? So what are we doing when we put people in water? Is that a second baptism? No. No, it's not. And I believe water baptism is simply a symbol of the spirit baptism. It's the same baptism. It's just the expression that the ide- you identify with Christ in His death and resurrection. That you are united with Him in His death and resurrection. So Paul is using a metaphor of baptism to explain what it means to be identified with Jesus. He says we are baptized into Christ. What does it mean? It means when we step into the grace of God through faith, we become one with Jesus. We are made one with Him. There is a spiritual union that takes place and baptism best illustrates this. 
That's what baptism illustrates. The believer is placed into Jesus, into his death, united with his death, and with his resurrection. When we crucify, we are crucified with Christ. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's not I that live anymore, but Christ that lives in me. He's been unified with Christ. The old life is buried. The old life died. Enslaved to sin, he is put to death. This is what the act of water baptism Express. This is the symbol of baptism. It declares that I am dead to sin. And all of this is the work of the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't end there. Verse 4 says, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father we too might walk in newness of life. So through our identification with Christ in His death and His resurrection, we have the glorious hope of the resurrection. Did you know that baptism actually has a future component? It not only tells what happened when you got saved, you were died with Him, you were raised to him, with Him to new life, but it also has a promise of a future resurrection. But it also has a transformative life that comes from being united with Jesus. When you are united with Him, when you are identifying Him, it changes your life. The transformative life says, I am no longer a slave of sin. The new life says, I can walk in newness of life. The Holy Spirit empowers me to live a life of righteousness. Here and now, God is sanctifying me and I can walk in holiness and obedience to God. Because of my identification with Christ. It brings a radical change in your life. We stand in grace, Romans 5 verse 2, I think, and this grace transforms us. This is why we cannot continue to live in sin. My brothers and sisters, if you are saved and a child of God, you cannot continue to live in sin. It's not who you are. If you are in Christ, you're a new creation. You're free from sin, separated from sin, dead to sin. You don't identify with sin anymore. It's not who you are. You're a child of God. You're a loved, beloved of the Lord. And God's children should not live in sin. That's what he's saying. You don't identify with sin. You identify with Christ, with His death, with His resurrection. You are dead to sin and alive to God. And when Jesus paid the penalty of death, and this is probably some of the most mysterious, remarkable things that Paul is saying, and I've read a few people, and some people really say it's, it's beyond our understanding how when Jesus died, it's not in the likeness of, is we actually are taken back 2,000 years when Jesus died on the cross and we die with Him. And my mind boggles. It, it's mind-blowing. I don't know how that works. When Jesus paid the penalty of death for sin, we paid the penalty in Him. Think about it. Your penalty is paid when you were in Him in some way 2,000 years ago. When Jesus died to sin, conquering its power, we who believe in Him died to sin and its conquering power. And this is what water baptism symbolizes. Being immersed into water symbolizes a burial. It symbolizes you are buried with Christ. Put someone in the water, it's a burial. 
And when someone is ray comes out of the water, it's it symbolizes being raised with him into newness of life. That's what water baptism simply means. This is the only reason. This is the only biblical understanding and reason why you should be baptized. It's the only reason. It's no other reason. You are not baptized so that you can become a member of a church. You are declaring that you identify with Christ's death and with his resurrection. You are declaring that Christ has made you new and that you are dead to sin. You know what you do when you do that? You're saying to the church, I'm dead to sin, so watch me. Watch me. And when we see you sin, what must we do? What does what the Bible say? We must help you. If someone stumbles, that's Galatians 6, I think. Those who are spiritually mature must help that person. In gentleness. In love. That's why we declare our identification with Christ's death and resurrection. As a result of your union with Christ, your identification with Christ's resurrection, you now walk in newness of life. You live now a different life. I I've, I've really have a, a struggle. When people say they are child, children of God, they've been saved, but they still live in sin. I, I really have to struggle with that. I'm not saying you must be perfect. No one is perfect. But when their lives are not changed, there's no difference. To live in sin is the opposite of what you are in Christ, of what, who you are in Christ. You should now walk in a consistent obedience to God. You should walk in righteousness. Paul is not saying that you are perfect sinless. He's rather saying that your life has a new direction. And God is sanctifying. And this process is progressing in your life. Now it brings me to the third point, and that's freedom from sin's dominion. I've said it many times this morning. We are free from sin's dominion. Listen to 5 and 6. For if we have been unified with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. What Paul is doing is to rebut those who charged, made a charge against Him, teaching that God's, God justifies the ungodly by faith, by grace through faith alone, apart from any works, and that this teaching could lead people to licentiousness, to, to ungodliness, to sinning. And he's rebutting them. He's showing that the reality of grace is that when you are in Christ, your life is completely the opposite to the life of someone who continues to sin. It's the opposite. Your identification with Christ's death and resurrection frees you from slavery to sin. It will empower you to walk in newness of life. You are free from sin's dominion. Here and now, must you must believe that act and act on the basis of your new identity in Christ. Not your old identity. The old self crucified. You are no longer slaves. You have been set free from sin's dominion over you. And sin is powerless over you. I wish people would say amen. Sin has no rule over you. Don't be. Let, let's, let me say it. Stupid. And do what the old man wants. I'm not talking about old people. Talking about the old man. 
before you got saved, okay? Just making sure we all understand this. <laughs> so I can see I'm looking at the... Anyways, application. I, I thought, let me, when I, when I um, prepared, try to make this practical. It is a fact that believers are free from sin. Amen. It is a fact that we are no, no longer slaves. But believers still struggle with sin. And um, how do we live in this freedom every day? How do we live in this freedom to overcome sin in our lives? The power is there to overcome. The Holy Spirit is there. But I want to give a few pointers, just a few pointers. I've got seven quick seven points that we can do in our own life. Practical ways as believers to live in this freedom of Christ. Number one, meditate on God's Word. Oh, it always comes back to that song we sang in Sunday school. Lees your Bible bid elke dag. Hello? Now in die Engelse kerke sing hulle dit nie. Ek weet nie wat sy song sing hulle nie. Read your Bible, pray out. Nee, het gaan nie werk nie. Is there a English version? Okay, sorry. Okay, just sounds funny. Okay, meditate on God's word. This will help you to understand and remember His promises and His principles for you. The Word of God shows you. It's important that you understand who you are in Christ. I believe that many people struggle with sin because they don't know who they are in Christ. Did you know in Christ you're more than a conqueror? Did you know that I am in Christ I can do all things through him who strengthens me know who you are in Christ number two cultivate a relationship with God through prayer through worship through fellowship how much time do you spend with the Lord number three and this is important be accountable be accountable Surround yourselves with other believers. That's why it's important. And can I say it? If you're not a member of our church, I'm not saying you should become a member of our church. But it's important to be a member of a church, of a local church, where you are accountable. Where people can keep you accountable. Be involved. We, it's, it's such an important thing to surround yourself with believers so they can support and encourage you to be involved in church. Bible studies is such a great opportunity. And I'm glad I see our Bible studies are growing. One day we're going to start a new church in, in Skumansville. Just get a building and a ground and, we, and the money to buy it. And then we can start the church there. But it's going well. Get involved in fellowship. It is difficult to live a life of sin when you have other believers in your life. It's when you isolate yourself that it becomes easy to sin. Number four, walk in the Spirit. We know Galatians 5. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, to give you the strength to ne- uh, that you need to walk in newness of life. That's a sermon on its own, how to walk in, walk in the Spirit. And we did in Ephesians also speak about walk in the Spirit. Recognize, number five, the consequences of sin. Sometimes it's good to think about sin and what the consequences are. Remember that sin damages your, number one, your fellowship with God. I intentionally say fellowship because in Afrikaans we, we, we have two words. Verwantskap, verhouden. Okay, what is it in English? Relation and relationship. My relation to God, I'm his child. That never changes. But my relationship, hmm, my fellowship with God, it damages that doesn't change the fact that you're still his child. Recognize that sin hinders your spiritual growth. 
recognize that sin is destructive. And not only as an impact on your own life, but also the life of people around you. Recognize that. Number six. And I, I, I don't know how... Let me say, develop holy habits. Is that right? Develop holy habits. One habit. What, 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 one habit. What's a good one? Do not miss the gathering together. Hebrews. And as some out of bad habit. Don't do it. It's a bad habit. Let one slip one. That's a bad habit. Develop holy habits. Practices that promote holiness in your life. This can be setting up boundaries. Don't walk into the lion's den and then try to get out. Stay out of the lion's den. You know, Joseph, what, I hear some people when they struggle with sin say, oh, okay, I'm, I stopped smoking. That's just an example. I don't know. He said, but I'm putting that, I'm, I still have a packet of cigarettes there on the counter. And it's to remind me not to do it. Not to smoke. And I'm thinking, you're tempting yourself. Huh? What did Joseph do? He ran away. You run away so far as you can. You throw it in the dustbin. You throw that alcohol in the drain if you've got a problem. You don't leave it in the cupboard until you fall. Do you hear what I'm saying? Put boundaries down. Avoid situations of influence that lead to sin in your life. Make deliberate choices that aligns with God's will. Develop holy habits. And the last one, yes, we stumble and fall. We do. Seek God's grace and forgiveness as quick as you can. I know when you sin, you don't have the confidence, you don't have the freedom just to come to God because you feel guilty and ashamed. But you must come to God as soon as possible. As soon as you have stumbled, turn to Him. Ask for forgiving grace. Ask for transforming grace. Seek His forgiveness with a sincere heart. Amen. These are just seven things I put together. Hopefully that will help. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. The Word is precious. The Word is, is a treasure. And Lord, yes, maybe a lot of the things that Your Word has said to us today is not new. It's things that we know. I pray today that you'll make it afresh and new to us. And may we just come to the realization that we are not slaves of sin anymore. We are free in Christ because of your death, your resurrection. We have been made new to walk in newness of life. And Lord, you are continuing working in us. Philippians, we read that the work you began in us, you will complete until the day of redemption. Thank you, Lord, that it's not in our own strength that we have to struggle in this life. But it's your, your Holy Spirit that gives us the ability, enables us to live lives that are pleasing to you. So yes, Lord, we pray this morning that you will sanctify us. We pray this morning that you will forgive us of our sins and our trespasses. And help us, Lord, to live lives that glorify you in every way. Pray this for each one of us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.